Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining in this session uh, on the topic of shifting scales, a new lens for cities. Uh, in this world context, we are very happy to be physically here together in Pantin uh, at Les Magasins Généraux, which is the HQ of the advertising agency BETC and BETC Places, uh, the entity which is uh, hosting this session today. So to introduce it briefly, uh, BETC Places uh, is the unit created by BETC, uh, the placemaking and innovation unit, uh, providing strategic advice on real estate and urban development projects, and collaborating with uh, the foremost international architectural and design studios. So I'm Fanny, I'm a strategist here at BETC, and I will moderate this uh, panel today. I'm very happy to welcome today uh, Pauline Marchetti, uh, architect, professor, and uh, founding partner of uh, Ferrier Marchetti Studio. Marion Valeur, uh, advisor to the Mayor of Paris uh, in um, architecture, patrimony, and urban landscape. Welcome. And Pierre-Emmanuel Becheron, uh, direc director of uh, art and culture department for the Société du Grand Paris. So welcome and thank you for joining. Uh, they are experts for today's panel with whom we're gonna talk about how cities are shifting scale uh, in this particular context of the pandemic and in our city, Paris. Uh, we've been living with this pandemic for now more than seven months. And of course it has uh, affected uh, our lives and uh, in particular our relation to the city. Um, more than ever, we are talking about density, about our urban way of living, about the desirability of the city. Um, will we all work from home? Uh, will uh, everyone move to places where they have more space? Uh, will urban life feel more like village life? Those are the questions that are starting to emerge from the pandemic. Um, and actually what I think is really interesting is that it's been uh, a long time uh, since we have talked that much about cities. And what is particularly enlightening is that today we are talking about cities through the prism of its inhabitants and their usages. So it's not only about theory, it's not only about infra infrastructures anymore, but it's really about people who are exper experimenting the city. And of course it has caused uh, widespread speculation about the future of cities. Uh, many medias even talk about uh, the death of cities. And we thought that today it would be more interesting rather than uh, speculating about uh, will the city will de uh, will be dead in a few years or not, but about how this is an opportunity for transformation. Um, and when we're talking about, um, uh, when we are observing this transformation, we realize that it's often, um, often a question of scale. And what do we mean by, by scale when we're talking about cities? Uh, actually, it's a very uh, large uh, spectrum when we're talking about uh, the new appropriation um, of some public or private spaces. When we are talking about the new approach of the neighborhood, we are talking about scales in a way. Uh, when we are talking about the 15-minute city, we are talking about scales. When we are talking about 70%, 72 percent of uh, uh, French people living in super urban areas uh, that are aspiring to move to less dense areas, we are talking about scales. And uh, to start talking about those scales, uh, I'll, turn to, I'll turn to you, Pauline Marchetti. Um, as I said before, during the lockdown, uh, suddenly our neighborhoods, our streets, our homes took a new dimension. Um, and in a way, we became more local than ever. Uh, you wrote recently about balconies uh, and the newfound role they took. Can you tell us more about this and how that, did it change the, the approach we have of the home? Yeah, um, I, I would say, first of all, that it's not newfound. I would say that it has always been there. And actually, it's the subtitle of our paper, which is the laudation of what is already there. And I think we were going to go back to the already there, but I think it's crucial in this scale issue that you are talking about. And more um, precisely on the future of cities. So, um, so it's already there, and nobody knows when it kind of disappeared from mm. the from the housing and the new housing projects. Um, the most important thing when we, talk, when we wanted to talk about balconies was to say, okay, um, pandemic is, is, a, is a crisis, that's for sure, but it's not a crisis that we have been facing, like you said in the Atlantic uh, paper that you're, we might uh, talk about, um, because it's a crisis that actually highlights the fact 
that there is a disconnection between the, uh, in, in the, between architecture and the citizen and the mm. people who are living in the architecture. And this disconnection has many reasons, and I'm not. I don't think it's a it's a topic today to think about why does the, this disconnection exist. But our architects were really definitely, uh, we have to be involved in, this, in the reconnection of uh, places and people. And when saying that, you don't talk about aesthetics, you, because it's not really the issue here. We don't talk ab about um, maybe economics, even if obviously uh, the economic issues are uh, very important. We talk about uh, the experience and how people are actually living their every, everyday life. Uh, I think we forgot to really, really take care of the everyday life. Like, it's a, it's a bit like everyday life is something negative. And actually, mm. we want to transform this everyday life as something very positive. So if you go to everyday life, then you have to go outside from your home very easily, even if it's an open window and a, very, and a square meter outside of the window. It's totally different the, the, the ambience and the experience of space. So every the life is linked, very really linked to the experience of space. And I think as architects, this is the focus we want to, 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 to develop. So that's, maybe that's why we took the balcony as mm -hmm. an example or as a pretext, I would say, uh, to, to talk about this everyday life and this important and the focus we have to, to, to have on these issues. Um, what do you think are the implications for the future of housing? Well, I, this I would say that for a long time, um, spaces, were, uh, um, spaces were related to body and experience, not, not on functions. And we know, everybody knows about functionalism and the modernist and the huge revolution of modernism in architecture. But there is a wrong uh, conclusion of this of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, history, which is the functionalism in a very very short scale or small scale, like you you were talking about scale. And I think this is really important to say. Now, when you build housing, uh, well, you built a kitchen, which is a kitchen, and it can be anything else than a kitchen or a bedroom, which is a bedroom, and you actually not tra can't transform a bedroom instead of of it and you go further and then there is a living room and the living room is, is the space left over because you have to focus on all the other spaces. So the living room is not even square sometimes. There is no balcony where to go out because it doesn't fit with the aesthetic of the facade and I'm sure we, are, we, want, we can talk about it later yeah. with Marion. <laughs> well, so obviously you forgot about everyday life to fo to, to uh, how can I say, to, to face issues that are not really important in, in, the, in that matter. So um, again, I think when you, when you focus on space, then you forget about functions, and then you can, f you can focus on experience of body, experience of atmospheres, and I'm quite optimistic that that's a good way to do the housing in the days to come. Uh, Pauline, you were talking about aesthetics and I know it's a big uh, topic for uh, Paris uh, uh, in these last uh, days. Uh, can you tell us more about, uh, about this? So in fact, um, we are now at an important uh, moment for the history of public space in Paris and it has a big impact on aesthetics because there are two main moves which are now uh, arriving in, uh, in Paris which are, first of all, the greening of streets, the fact that we are planting more our streets, and second, the fact that we want to give more space for pedestrians and bicycles. And th those two moves combined will completely change uh, the aesthetics of the Parisian street, because it will change the proportion and the the size that we let to, to cars and to pedestrians and the, also the space that we let to, um, to uh, mineral spaces and uh, green spaces. So it is a big move and we have to think about it also in terms of aesthetics so that, um, so that those new uses uh, actually fit well with Paris. And, uh, and so we are now engaging uh, a debate 
with the Parisian people, with experts, to think about uh, this, uh, this move of public space in terms of aesthetics, but also in terms of uses. And uh, for example, we are, we are now uh, transforming a half of parking spaces in Paris. It will be a huge amount of public space, which has the opportunity of become something else than mm -hmm. just a parking space. Uh, every parking space, outside parking space, is uh, 10 square meters. It's a huge space where you can uh, actually, uh, where kids can play, where you can plant, where you can put a, a bicycle lane. And so this will change the use of the street. And I think it's a very interesting moment for Paris. And so your plan is to come up with a manifesto and some guidelines that would, that would stay for like five years, uh, six years. What is the, um, the temporality of, the, of this manifesto? I, I can't answer precisely uh, that question because it's, uh, now it's the beginning of the mandate and so those questions will be, uh, will be precised uh, after. But basically the idea is to have common rules Mm. that apply both to the city of Paris itself and to, uh, to partners that, has, that have an impact on the mm -hmm. Parisian public space. And uh, those rules will also uh, regulate um, the uses of the Parisian people themselves when they act on public space, but also of shops, restaurants, etc. So it's, uh, it's really a new um, partnership with the Parisian people and with the economic uh, actors in Paris. Thank you. And there is also another question that was uh, really popular and really discussed worldwide. It's the 15-minute city. Um, can you tell us more about this concept and also how does it apply to Paris specifically? Because I have to say I was quite surprised when I saw this concept uh, emerged. Because to me, as a Parisian, I felt that it was something existing since a very long time in Paris. That is our daily life to have... Uh, everything, uh, I will let you uh, explain the concept, but to have like everything uh, at 15 minutes uh, by foot or bike, uh, etc. And yeah, I was wondering, is it like, how does it apply to Paris? And uh, how would, would it apply to other cities and maybe in the suburbs where it's a major stake uh, to have this uh, accessible or not? So the idea of the 15 minute city is quite basic. It's to have all the services you need uh, at a scale of 15 minutes by walk or by bicycle. And, um, and uh, it aims at, um, at, uh, at an uh, ecological way of life because you don't have to take your car to go mm -hmm. far away. And it's also a question of quality of life. Because if you, if you can access to all services 15 minutes from your house, it means that you will uh, spend less time in the uh, in the transportation and that, uh, and that you will have also more time to be with uh, the people you, you love and uh, to do things you like. Of course. And um, so it's, it's quite a simple idea, but it's uh, when you know metropolitan life uh, across the world, uh, in fact, it's often not the case. And so our role as uh, cities mm -hmm. is to, um, to ensure that it is possible in every area. In Paris, as you said, we are very lucky because the shape of our city, uh, which is very dense and quite small, yeah. uh, allows this, the implementation of this concept quite well. Because uh, Haussmann has designed our city in a way that you can do everything by walking, mm. almost. And, uh, and that you can find a lot of services uh, not far from, uh, from your apartment. And in fact, a lot of people, when they think about Paris, they also think about the fact that you have a bakery just uh, one minute from your apartment. And that's things that you find only in Paris. So we have this very good basis and we want to reinforce it. First, because it is not the case in all areas in Paris, mm -hmm. and uh, especially in some areas which are um, closer to the suburbs, yes. where we need to reinforce the services and the shops. And uh, of course, it's an idea that we want to share with the greater Paris because we think that this level of uh, quality of life uh, could, be, um, could be more equal, uh, mm -hmm. equally uh, shared between, uh, between cities. And, uh, 
And it's actually an idea that uh, can fit to very different types of cities. Even if European cities seem more um, easily uh, uh, linked to this idea of 15-minute city, but we know that it's a concept uh, that interests a lot American cities, where in fact sometimes you cannot do anything uh, without your car. So I think it's a, it's a very powerful concept that can guide uh, public action and, uh, and also because in those times of crisis it's very important to have a resilient area, to have a resilient neighborhood, like to know that uh, you can ask your neighbors something if you don't feel well, if you need a service. And sometimes in metropolitan life we are very anonymous, which is sometimes nice, but uh, sometimes it's not nice to not have a neighbor you can talk to. So um, with the 15-minute city, you're also able to have more uh, uh, proximity uh, social links. And uh, I think that's very important also. So in a way, it's a way for Paris to shine also worldwide with this, with this concept, because we saw in every international newspaper uh, um, uh, this concept taken. And you answered in a way, but do you think that it's really an universal um, scale because 15 minutes in a way it's a scale like applicable to any country we saw that uh, i think it's melbourne that just uh, presented the 20 minute neighborhoods so how do you think other countries and other cities can maybe um, uh, take this concept for themselves yeah i think it has to that to every context of course but uh, uh, when you have to walk 40 minutes you don't walk you know, yeah, you will take your car. So there's a, a maximum mm. uh, so that people are actually uh, really encouraged to walk or to take their bicycle. And it shouldn't be too long. So in a way, they, yes, this, uh, this scale is a bit universal if we want people to walk more, I think. I so it's a, it's a good metric for urban planners. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Pierre-Emmanuel Becheron. Um, the Grand Paris Express, Express project, um, our future metro in Paris, uh, first appears as a super scale project. Uh, can, you can you tell us about the Grand Paris Express and how it will uh, change the, the city for the better? Yes, um, so Grand Paris Express is maybe today the most important urban project and infrastructure project in Europe. Uh, we are building uh, 200 kilometers of new metro lines. So four new metro uh, lines around Paris with a main line, an orbital line all around Paris, maybe two or three kilometers behind the peripheric. So the main object of this uh, project is to, to give more connection to, to all the suburbs around Paris and to connect this new network to the existing uh, network, metro network, but also train, bus station, tramway. So how to connect uh, more with uh, public mobility, with public transportation, uh, all the suburbs. You know, today uh, in the Greater Paris, 70% of the mobility is from one suburb to another one. So it's a big issue to design this new project, to connect more the suburbs between the other suburbs and to connect also more the suburbs with Paris. Uh, you know, when you, you live today in uh, clichy Montfermeil, for example, north-east of Paris, you are maybe at 10, 11 kilometers from the, the Tour Eiffel, the center of Paris. But with the public transportation, it's one hour 30 uh, distance. Mm. So a very long time for a short distance because of the lack of uh, good infrastructure and good connection. So we are working on this project. Uh, we work to deliver the first station for 2024 mm -hmm. for the Olympic Games. And uh, we plan to deliver the full uh, network, so 200 kilometers of uh, lines in uh, 2030. Uh, 68 new station. We are building 68 new station. Uh, we used to work a lot of the station with uh, Pauline. Uh, which were, um, we were um, architect advisor for the Société du Grand Paris, which is a public company in charge of designing uh, the new metro. So 
the main issue is how to connect the new station to the neighborhood, how to create uh, connection links between uh, the, the implementation of this new network and the development of all this neighborhood around the stations. So yes, it's because archi architectural issue, but also urban issue uh, and public space. We are working a lot on public space designing around the stations. Yes, because actually, uh, to come back to our question of scales, uh, it's not only a super scale project. It's also a multi scale project because, in a way, uh, we could imagine that this would cr this will create new centers, new hubs, uh, all around the Greater Paris. Uh, and I'm speaking like culturally speaking, but also economically speaking. I think on the cultural uh, on the cu cultural axis, you have also uh, many things to. Yeah, yes, we are always working uh, uh, with two two main scales, local and global. Y if you add all the perimeters uh, of walking distance around the station. So five, five, ten minutes walking distance of the station, and you, you add all these 68 perimeters around the, 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 the station. The total um, size of all these perimeters is 1.3 the size of Paris. So the impact of this new um, uh, network uh, will be huge, the size more than Paris. Uh, so we have to to think about this impact uh, in the globality of uh, for for Paris region, but also at the scale of each local impact of each station. We can have a guidelines, uh, 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 main rules for all these neighborhoods, for all the stations, but we have to decide uh, with uh, some. Uh, kind of manifesto, how to, um, uh, how to have specific policies for each station mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, urban policies, architectural policies, because uh, the Greater Paris is composed by a diversity, a huge diversity of territories with uh, different histories, different geographies, uh, difference uh, of uh, also architecture. Uh, we are not in uh, the center of Paris with a very um, um, uh, standard uh, uh, type of uh, streets, type of buildings with Osman. Uh, in the greater Paris, we have very different urban context. So we have to deal with all these different urban context to, to propose specific uh, answer for each station and each neighborhood around the station. A and can you tell us about the cultural approach of the project? Uh, yeah, culture is a, a, a tool to, um, for us it's, it's a real tool to develop the project. Uh, it's a, a tool to, to design the stations because we decide to, to commission artists for each station. Uh, in dialogue with uh, all the architects involved in the project. So we are working to, to reinvent the station and to, to, to design a beautiful station. It's why architects, designers, artists are working to create a specific uh, object in each territory. Uh, and uh, we are thinking about how this uh, all these specific objects uh, are um, will implement uh, the heritage of tomorrow of the city of tomorrow, uh, and we have to to design good good station for all the users. But uh, we are also working on um, artisting program during the construction, the time of construction, and here the objective is to involve all the citizens. In the in the construction of the project, so for example, two two or three times a year, we organize uh, big big parties on uh, the construction sites, uh, and we invite all the citizens around the station, and uh, this kind of uh, artistic or cultural project is a good way to uh, to involve uh, population in the project, and it's also uh, empowerment policies. 
uh, with this type of big project. We, we know that uh, we have a lot of difficulties in France from now uh, 20 years with uh, big projects, the notion of grand projet, which is very complicated in the relationship with uh, citizens. And culture is also a, a way to, to, to create this connection between the projects, the construction, the construction sites, and inhabitants. It's a tool to humanize. Uh, yeah, it's a tool to humanize. It's a tool to, to for the public to feel to feel involved, involved mm. in this project and to discover or see this project. You know, uh, traditionally, uh, a site construction it's a, a black box in the uh, in the urban uh, uh, scape and uh, with this for example this type of action as a, a construction site party it's a way to to open this black box to the citizen and it's a way to to explain to the citizen that this project is not for the state or for the politician but it's for people mm. thank you um, I'm now opening the discussion for the three of you. Um, I was reading this article in, uh, in The Atlantic highlighting how disasters along the history shaped um, the modern cities, improved them. Uh, we saw many examples where visionary um, responses to catastrophes uh, changed the city life for the better. To what extent do you think that the pandemic we're living right now um, is an opportunity to transform the, the cities around the world? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I will. I would say that in this article is very interesting, but there is a difference between what's happening now and this article, which is, it we are not facing a tabula rasa uh, situation. Absolutely mm. not, and hopefully not. I would say. Um, so it's more. We have to be more subtle than actually reconstruction. Reconstruction uh, the city. That's for one thing which I want to focus on to make it clear. Um, now, saying that innovation will solve the problem, I think we have to think about what kind of innovation we are talking about. If we talk about technology, I would say it's a dead end. Uh, why? Because, um, like I said before, and like I, we understood from the two other people around uh, this table, is that we need to focus on the power of citizens, power of community, and the power of what is already there. I think we, un, 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 well, with the mask is complicated, underestimate the, the situations and the fact that people are actually involved in their city, city life. Um, so when I see, for example, the, the proposition of, uh, of Paris with uh, uh, taking care of the public space and get rid of 50% of cars in public space, it will obviously change the everyday experience of streets. It will change the experience of atmospheres, it will change the exposure of many other things that only the trees which are going to be planted over there. Mm. And why that is because, like you said, the scale of those streets have been thought not only about functions and uh, um, efficiency, but with some kind of um, tools that we need to go back to, which are uh, the ambiences, the relation to body, the relationship with the, with the, with the sky, the relationship with climate, things that have been forgotten. And we don't have to go back to technology to focus and, uh, and use those tools to create stuff. Um, and why I say that? Uh, I say that because I, I've heard about something that you might be uh, connected to and yourself as well, is the idea of that if you combine data and information in a big computer, then you put a button and then you have the wonderful city that solves all the problems. Mm -hmm. I think this is first frightening and also an issue uh, and solution which has been proved wrong mm. and not, uh, um, not uh, efficient. Uh, top down, okay, we are all agreed around this table, we have to forget about it. So. What does it mean? It means that you have to focus on the community and the experience and you go back to those kind of tools. Uh, and I think that if you go to a big project like the Grand Paris project, if you go in, in a 
politics and the issue that you are going to face when you need to deliver as a mayor or if you go back to my work which is more creative and I think we all share the same thing that we are in a dead hand now and it's not reconstruction mm. it's something else um, when you go on sustainability and I will do a quick um, shift to sustainable issues there is no other way now to uh, to face the issues with sustainability that to refurbish and uh, use what's already there as buildings, for example. Uh, reconstruction, deconstruction, reconstruction, it's, it is proved, it is the worst things to do. So what, how you can do that? You definitely know, you definitely have to be using the power of citizenship, the power of community to do so. And that is to say, you definitely need to overcome this idea of innovation and to use it as a tool to talk around the table and make it make make the future works the future of city works the, there is a, a symbolic move i think uh, illustrating what you're saying is the the fact that uh, the project of uh, Keyside uh, by sidewalk clouds in toronto were uh, abandoned during this period and maybe it's also a sign that uh, all, all the actors are not the good actors for the city, maybe, and also data and all the issues that, uh, that are linked to with the privacy uh, and many more uh, issues are not the good solution and what people are expecting at the end. Yeah, I think, I think creative people have a move to do right now. They definitely have to make uh, them to speak loud, loudly. Uh, mm. And because when you talk about creativity, you talk about a way to find a solution in the middle of complex situations. Uh, what you talk about Toronto is, I mean, I mean, developers will always find a way to build the biggest and the, uh, that the, that's what they do, but they, they definitely need another sol other solutions. Mm. And now I think they li will listen more. Mm. They listen more because They've been used to listen more. I mean, the uh, Réinventé Paris, maybe we're going to talk about it, but has been a wonderful tool to make them learn and to make them listen. We have to go a little bit deeper. We have to be, we have to be a little bit stronger in this kind of situation. So innovation, yes, but this kind of innovation, which is subtle and flexible and, and not uh, like, uh, how can I say... Uh, too strong and too one no reminded. Mm. Thank you. Yes, I think the um, the pandemics was the the opportunity for many people to rediscover their neighborhood uh, in a very basic way. When you have uh, when we, you can walk only like uh, one kilometer from your home, you you just look at things that you don't look uh, on an everyday uh, basis. And, um, and it was very useful to reconnect people with their environment and, uh, and also to, um, to discover that some spaces were completely underused. For example, uh, in Paris, all the courtyards, uh, sometimes you know, it's on only the space where you cross and sometimes you say hello to your neighbor, but it can become a, a playground for your children. It can, uh, it can become a garden. And those spaces are mostly underused in Paris. So I think during the pandemics, a lot of people uh, looked differently mm. at, this, uh, at those uh, spaces. At the street also, where children were, can, al always, uh, can also play. And, um, and that's an opportunity. And as, uh, as you said, it's also, it also invites all the all the actors of, um, of urban planning to, to go back to, to more simple things, uh, basic things of um, what, do we need, uh, what do we need in terms of, uh, of having an access to sky, you know, to, to fresh air, to green spaces, and uh, you don't need to, to have so much data some, sometimes to, um, to create those neighborhoods. You just have to go back to simple metrics uh, to ensure uh, a basic uh, life quality to, to citizens. So I think it was um, quite a useful message for, for the urban ecosystem. 
And uh, lately, we've seen an iterative wave of quick changes. I don't know if quick is the right word, but mm. uh, we saw that some new decisions were taken and applied very quickly, like the slow street, the prioritization of uh, bicycles, pedestrian. Do you think experimentation is a, is a way to, to transform the cities? It's a, it's a, it's a tool, it's a, it's a way of thinking uh, the transformation that can fit to, to Paris? Yeah, in fact, tactical urbanism was really uh, at the heart of uh, public action um, during and uh, after uh, the, the lockdown. And um, more precisely, we, uh, we acted very quickly on the bicycle lanes, on the um, on terraces, and uh, it was useful uh, for the city to see that we could do some things in two weeks while normally we do it in like uh, two years. So, and to see also how public, sh public space can change uh, quite quickly and, uh, and how it, it can work. Like uh, the Rue, Rue de Rivoli, which was um, dedicated uh, to uh, bicycles, pedestrians, and uh, buses, and, uh, and taxis, uh, it actually worked, you know. And, uh, and so it's very useful sometimes to, to act quickly to see that it works. And w when it doesn't work, you can adapt it because uh, it's very uh, agile. And so I think it, uh, it is really inspiring for public action Uh, because we have to think about how we change public space and sometimes we really need experimentation uh, before doing a big project. Like it's, it's really a, a, a more interesting approach to, to, to test uses. You, you cannot always know, you know uh, what, yeah. what will happen and that's the beauty of public space. So you have to try to see what works or not. And, uh, and, uh, and I think we will do more and more uh, this way, uh, our, public, our urban project. Experimentation is also a tool for the, the project of uh, the Grand Paris Express, uh, um, especially in the design uh, part. Yeah, around the stations. Not for the infrastructure, because yes, of course. infrastructure <laughs> is long-term <laughs> conception, We have to deal with many uh, uh, difficulties uh, with the underground the construction and, and all these type of topics. But for for the use, using of the station, for all the design of the public spaces around the station, we are working a lot with all different municipalities around Paris. Uh, to think about how, how ca we can use experimentation with uh, universities, with schools, uh, also with uh, designers, uh, to, to have uh, real testing yes. of uh, equipment, of uh, uh, urban furniture, of uh, urban designing. So, yeah, it's an um, important uh, way of action for us also. Um, and this crisis is a good opportunity to develop all this type of, uh, of experimentation because uh, the shock was huge for everybody. And uh, with this kind of shock, you, it's always an opportunity to, 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 to make moves and to test some, uh, to develop testing of, uh, of action and experimentation. Of course. Uh, do you have uh, any, any examples worldwide of uh, transformations in some cities related to, to the pandemic or not that, uh, that happened and that, that were inspiring for you? Do you have any examples to share with us? Well, I've not, not been traveling a lot since the pandemic, so I don't know about <laughs> other cities than Paris. Um, no, but that I have, an, I have a, an example which is really interesting and which is not well known for this kind of stuff is Shanghai. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working a lot over there and actually we developed this concept of central city. So the city based on the experience of senses over there because uh, Shanghai is, is, has this really special aspect of being huge, so frightening, but it's also a city where you can walk in 15 minutes and find many, 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 many things mm. that you need where a contemporary and modernism is linked and mer merged with traditions, 
where public spaces and public uh, and uh, merge and share is uh, public space is shared by daily life um, and people look from across the world that are using this space because Shanghai is a network city I mean so uh, so I would say that this kind of city which is not well known as I said mm -hmm. for that is really interesting we developed this concept of um, uh, regard recipro reciprocity uh, look of our Asian cities for example because I'm sure that we will find our solution here and now in Western cities, old Western cities, by having an understanding of how other cultures are using public spaces and are developing uh, their, their, uh, their cities. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you heard about that, but China, China uh, just said like a month ago that they were going to focus on air pollution. So. And we know the, the power of those kind of, of, of policy, polit, policies. So where the problem in Shanghai is air pollution for definitely is, is, is a problem. We can hope that they will find a solution. So, I mean, we, it's not that simple as finding, uh, finding solution in all kinds of cities. Of course. And just to go back to experimentation, because I think it's really important um, we forgot that we sometimes have the right to be wrong. And I mean, people are um, in our kind of work, we, de we need to deliver all the time and we need to deliver right all the time. And actually, I don't think it's what citizens are expecting from us. And I think citizens are expecting from our expertise and, and, and uh, uh, knowing stuff, but not deliver the right thing. Mm. So the power of being wrong, but the power of to of going back to what we do, we did, and to do, to do it differently, is huge. And when you talk about creative creative people, then it's a huge issue for us. I mean, designing things, public spaces, buildings, housing, with the with the with an opportunity for the people that they could change and that we could adapt to it the way they want to do. And that's that's something we have to face and we have to, to address now. I mean, it's, it's now, it's not tomorrow. And I think, yeah, I'm agree with this idea. Uh, and one, ma one big problem is the cost of the wrong ideas, the wrong uh, buildings, the wrong infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So I think now we have to think more about uh, hardware uh, and, and say, okay, we have to 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 design uh, perfectly this infrastructure, perfectly this hardware of the city. Yeah. But uh, in the same time, we we have to to introduce more uh, evolutivity uh, for the software of the city uh, and for all this uh, scheme of uh, of the city that can move in the time. Mm and change a lot. So how to think a city uh, as a hardware and a software and to, to have a different time of uh, evolution uh, with these two types of uh, designing is an important question, I think. Uh, I like the, exa the example of uh, Barcelona mm -hmm. that changed um, uh, the way of... Um, sorry, the the um, <laughs> the way uh, for cars um, to to move in the city, they took some neighborhoods and they said, okay, we want this neighborhood uh, to be uh, without uh, transit traffic, and uh, and so they just changed the the ways in the streets, mm -hmm. and it completely changes some areas, and they you don't need technology for that. You just you just change the 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 way yeah, yeah. Mm. and um, and I think that's quite brilliant and uh, so actually some neighborhoods become quite uh, uh, pedestrian uh, and so that's very inspiring uh, for for public space in in big cities. Yeah. Pauline, you are talking about uh, Shanghai and um, th there is also one question that emerged from uh, this pandemic is the question of density that was really discussed uh, and 
more than discussed, there were a lot of debates around this question with some people, I'm caricaturing, but some people against it and saying that uh, it was related as, as associating uh, with uh, crowds. And some people, uh, on the contrary, um, uh, showing that uh, actually urban density can be uh, ecologically good uh, and can improve the city. So what w I would like to, to know your take on, on this uh, subject of density. Well, it depends on the density you're talking about. I mean, it's the density of construction, density of people. I mean, you said that density of construction is a, has a, a good impact in terms of ecology. It's for sure. I mean, there is less areas and soil that has been spoiled by construction. So it's good. On the other hand, uh, when a pandemic it, it, it happens, when density makes people are made the city not working anymore. I mean, when you talk about density of people, it means a good city life. And that's for sure a good thing. So, I mean, the issue of density for me is a, it's not really a good, it's a nonsense. I mean, yeah, we, we, we should focus yeah. on context, as we said, and obviously uh, more, most about how, you, how territories are linked all together than focusing on the density of one onto another. The link and the sharing is really important. And it's not only about construction and people, it's also about resources. I mean, I don't know if we're going to have the time to talk about the resources of the city, the, the, the resources like how you build cities. Definitely we need to focus on that as well. Uh, and the scale, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, the scale is definitely an issue when you talk about resources as well. So density, I, I would say the debate is open, but let's talk about real issues like resources mm, and something like that. You share the, the same the same vision. Yes, and I, I think there is a sometimes a dangerous debate where people uh, actually uh, um, present density as as if it was the enemy of ecology. Yeah, and it's it's actually the contrary. Mm. Uh, and uh, we know that the the um, the first thing for a city to be ecological is density because it allows people to walk or go by bike from one place to uh, another uh, and also it, uh, it allows energies to circulate uh, more easily. So I mean density is really the ally to ecology. I think it's important to say it, to repeat it because, uh, because with, with a NIMBY not in my backyard movements, mm. sometimes it's, uh, it's not so, so clear anymore. And, uh, and then we have to find the right level of density uh, everywhere, so sometimes it has to be more dense, sometimes less dense. We have to 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 measure it, and uh, and if we need uh, at uh, at some places to add uh, more green space and less buildings, yes, it is a, it is an option. But uh, I think this debate has uh, has become sometimes um, not very rational. And and for example, in France, we have to remind that the the our main uh, urban challenge right now is uh, the artificialization of soil. And so if you refuse density, the result you get is urban sprawl, mm -hmm. is the fact that we will, uh, um, that we will build on uh, agricultural land, on uh, green space, and nobody wants that. That's at the, at the, at the scale of, uh, of France, it is our biggest challenge now. So at one point we have to, to have this broad vision and to say, okay, where do we want to, to build? On agricultural land or in dense spaces? And, uh, and so I think this needs a honest debate. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that the question of uh, uh, economic and social inequalities is more m maybe important and more interesting than uh, on density against or uh, against the density uh, and it's a, a true question with uh, the crisis also because the crisis reveal a lot of new uh, social inequalities and uh, um, a, a big question for me is how tomorrow we can uh, we can think about the, the 15 minute walk distance city uh, but not against uh, a 45 uh, minutes uh, uh, by car uh, city for poor people. 
the risk is to have uh, two types of cities, to shape two types of cities, uh, the 15 minute cities for rich people and uh, a 45 car city for poor people. So it's why the, um, the question of, uh, of how to, to connecting different scales is, is important and to, to have a, a local uh, action, local yes. policies, but also a global vision with, the, met with the, the scale of the metropolis, with all the greater Paris area, but also all the urban metropolis region, uh, to think about how to cross between these different scales and uh, how to involve the, 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 the design of uh, public spaces, of buildings, of, uh, of the question of balconies, of uh, uh, greening the streets for everybody and not only for which people who, who are living in the center of the, of the agglomeration. And this is also a big question uh, and we are working a lot with uh, the Ville de Paris on this mm -hmm. question and with the question of Grand Paris and the, this new infrastructure, this new metro, is to, to offer more uh, urban quality to more people. And this, I think this is a true question, how to, to offer more urban quality for more people. Very interesting. And you are talking about uh, the difference between the center of Paris, where we can uh, have uh, those, uh, those questions of 15-minute cities, and the suburbs that don't have the same uh, quality of life and access to the same questions. There is, I know it's a never-ending debate, but there is still uh, a physical and psychological barrier uh, between the center of Paris and the suburb is the peripheric. So the peripheric for those who are not uh, familiar with uh, the city of Paris is the beltway that surrounds Paris. Um, what do you think about uh, the peripheric? It was a big debate. There were many uh, options uh, on the table. What is your, your feeling about it? And it will be my last question. <laughs> uh, it's true that the peripheric is today a physical barrier between uh, Paris, the center of Paris, and the suburbs. So there is the question of how to, to, to create uh, uh, new continuities, new way, new path uh, between Paris and the suburbs, and to make uh, this type of physical barrier disappear progressively in the time. But there is also another question, uh, more a psychologic uh, question is how to um, how to in the sp in the spirit of the city how to think uh, that if you are living in Paris in the center of Paris or in Pantin for example we are in Pantin here it's maybe two kilometers from Paris how to think that we are living in the same uh, city mm. and we are we share the same history we share uh, common interests. Uh, we share also uh, commons, we share e equipments, and we have to think the city uh, with all these uh, different scales. So my local uh, scales, my neighborhood, uh, my, uh, my shops uh, around my house, but also how to connect uh, this scale with the big scale uh, and in this big, big scale, uh, peripheric, so this belt around Paris, uh, has to disappear. And we have to create a relationship, a new relationship between uh, all these cities, all these municipalities around Paris and the city of Paris. And we have to, to improve our public policies uh, at this scale, not only uh, in each cities, uh, or for each it is, uh, but developing new uh, relationships uh, and new policies between cities. Thank you. Marion, do you, what do you yes, think? Yes, I, I completely agree and I think it's uh, good, good news to see that now the idea that the, the peripheric, the ring road, has to evolve is quite a consensual mm -hmm. idea between mm. Paris and, totally. the, and the cities around. and. Uh, and now the, um, 
there is a common vision uh, and uh, and actually it's also tactical urbanism i mean everybody knows that it will take some time to make the ring road evolve and uh, and so there is the idea of having a first step for the olympics of having more um, uh, clean vehicles uh, and uh, and a lane only for car sharing and uh, and clean vehicles on uh, on the ring road and the idea is that after it has uh, to become something else than a highway. Like, it's it's very difficult to have an, a highway so close to the city center. It's it's actually very rare, and so we have to make it uh, something new, a new mm. landscape, uh, a new type of street or boulevard for for the Greater Paris. And I think it's uh, it's possible, like to to have a more to imagine that people or bicycles can go there. That uh, that there is a, there are parks that we can have a really mixed used space that will be completely unique. I think what's important to have in mind is that the ring road is a, a unique space uh, where you have also sometimes uh, views on uh, Paris or the suburbs that you don't have uh, in other spaces, and that we have to keep this space uh, quite unique. And of course, it will be possible only with uh, also a psychological change of course. Uh, in, the, in our relation between Paris and, uh, and the suburbs, definitely. It's not only a question of infrastructure, it's a, it's a question of a state of mind and the fact that uh, tomorrow uh, it shouldn't be an issue for a firm or a person to move to, um, to a city which is not Paris. Yeah, it should be normal, like, like it is in London, you know. Yeah, totally. Well, if you don't think the periphery are the motorway, if you think it about like an empty space, like you said, with a with the issue oh. of children. I mean, I mean, families and children are u wonderful tools to make people change. Mm -hmm. There is an example in uh, in Amsterdam after World War II, when uh, an architect named Aldo van Eyck transformed mm -hmm. all the vacant and all the buildings where where have, where have been destroyed by World War II by u doing uh, very very. Uh, simple playgrounds and those playgrounds begin to make people talk again to each other and make a sense of community and actually and afterwards I think there are, are more than 800 playgrounds in, in Amsterdam at that time uh, built by uh, Van Eyck for the city of Amsterdam and those empty spaces be begin with the seeds of a new kind of city well I think the periphery is a wonderful seed uh, to become a new, a new for, for the new image of Paris, and as you said, there is no. I mean, a physical barrier is not an issue. I mean, the Greater Paris is uh, irrelevant right now because, in for from in in mind, not 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 in physical, um, not in a physical way. So, as an empty space, it's an univers des possibles. It's a, a huge possibilities. There is a huge possibilities that can be used. And you don't even see it like a loop. You can see it uh, from uh, space to space, from a little part and little parts, and then it's not a loop anymore and something else. And, and you can develop uh, many things. It's a wonderful place where you have green and, and actually hers. I mean, it's, uh, there most of the greenery in Paris are from the, from the Epiphake. So I would say it's a possibility, a wonderful place of possibilities and, and not not a barrier. Thank you. It will be your last word, I think. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. This is the, the end of our session. And uh, have a good day or a good evening, for w depending where you are in around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.